Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Casey Winters, and I work on growth at Pinterest. And I've uh, been there for about two and a half years, worked on various elements of the growth stack. Uh, prior to Pinterest, I worked at Grubhub for five and a half years, so started the marketing department there, built up acquisition and retention there. And before that, I spent a few years working on online classifieds. So spent a lot of time working on growing online businesses, um, and I have a lot of examples of things we've done to drive retention in all those businesses. So today I'm going to talk about breakfast, lunch, and dinner for retention, and, and I'll get into what that means. So the, the first thing to understand about retention is understanding if you're at product market fit. Uh, and the question you should ask is like, well, how do you know? Uh, so it's a good question. Uh, the short answer is you have customers or users that are actively using your product, and they'd be pissed if it went away. So Sean Ellis, uh, first marketer at Dropbox, um, basically says that if 40% of users respond to a survey saying they'd be pissed if it went away, then you're in good shape. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to argue with him, but I think the answer is more nuanced here. Um, but the bottom line is, like, if you think you're at product market fit, it's probably because you're up at night thinking, oh, I know my market, I know my customers, I just don't know how to get more of them. That's the problem you're dealing with instead of how do I provide value to customers. Uh, I like to take a more nuanced view on how cohort analysis works, though, than just surveying people. Uh, and the way I do that is I do a cohort analysis. So the cohort analysis, you have a group of people that tried your product in a period of time, which is on here is uh, zero. This could be day zero, this could be month zero, uh, whatever your time frame is. And then what you want to do is you want to see how many continue to use your product throughout a longer time period. Let's say this is 12 months. And you're going to have a fairly deep drop, unless you're a subscription business or something, you're going to have a fairly deep drop off on the first month. That is OK. Um, it's fairly natural. You should try to improve it all the time. Um, but what you really want to know is, does it flatten somewhere? If it flattens, there are a group of customers that are finding value in your product that you can build on top of. Um, so you at least have product market fit for those customers. Um, so then you need to ask yourself, can I get more of those customers and grow this cohort and keep them as engaged as this cohort looks? Question. Is there any time you should look at weekly behavior or weekly intervals instead of monthly intervals? Sure. Um, it, a certain amount of weeks? it depends on the ideal frequency for, for your product. So at Pinterest, we look at weekly intervals. We're trying to create Pinterest as an app that's a regular habit. Uh, for Grubhub, we would look at you know, uh, monthly intervals, so how many people order delivery at least once a month. So it depends on what you think the ideal level of frequency is for your business. Some things you might not need very often, but they're extremely valuable when you need them. And in that case, you, be sent, you don't want to be saying, oh, people didn't return the next month and use me, therefore I don't have product market fit. At apartments.com, people only look for apartments like once a year. So saying that, oh, people didn't come after they found an apartment, that means we don't have a good product, like that would be a bad idea. All right, um, so what you need to understand when you do a cohort analysis is not just does it you know, go to zero or does it flatten, but can you grow a business um, with that type of retention? So the ability to acquire users at less than the amount of money you make from that curve, to me, represents true market, product market fit. So if you're like Pinterest in 2012 and you're not making any money, you need to be able to grow users with a similar cohort or increasingly better cohort um, graph without spending any money. And if you can't do that, um, and if you're, or if you're making money, um, it's about growing the cohort size with a cost per acquisition less than the revenue you make on those users over a time frame you can predict. So when I mean like time frame you can predict, um, it's basically as long as you can reasonably with statistically significant data prove out in the future. So for early stage companies, that's not a lot of time. You don't have a lot of historical data. So it's usually around three months. And then mid-stage, you push it out to six months. Late stage, you might do a year or even more. Uh, and if you can't grow your cohort size with where your current cohort uh, graph flattens, then you're not at product market fit. And you need to improve where the cohort flattens to be able to afford the users that you want to bring in. Does that make sense to people? Are there any questions there? OK, great. Um, so what happens if you scale pre-product market fit? Um, basically, bad things happen. <laughs> um, so does anyone remember Branch Out? I'm dating myself a little bit, but does anyone remember Branch Out? No. Man, Man this is the, OK, we got, we got one over here. Um, I need to like add Homejoy instead. That's a, that's a more frequent one. Um, 
So branch out. Uh, they were built as a professional networking service on top of Facebook. Um, this is the stupidest fucking idea I'd ever heard. But um, back then, Facebook had Open Graph, where you could like massively spam people and, and get invites and get signups with kind of tricking users. Um, so Branch Out um, started scaling user acquisition really aggressively. They had 25 million users in something like six months, crazy growth, and grabbed 25 million in Series C funding. So really quick acquisition, really quick growth, really quick scaling of the company. The problem is no one ever came back. So this is probably like a year later, um, same headline, same same publication calling them a recruitment train wreck, and they were uh, aqua hired to Hearst, not even a technology company. So turns out, you know, spamming um, Facebook users and tricking them into sign up isn't building a business, even if you have 25 million people that do that. Um, does anyone remember Viddy? Okay, we got a couple more people who remember Viddy. So Viddy was in a fierce battle to become the Instagram for video uh, a couple years ago, um, and. And they were in a battle with another company called Social Cam. So while Social Cam kind of figured out what they had and had a nice exit, Viddy went for it. They raised um, 300 in, in uh, th like 30 million at 370 million dollar valuation. Top free app on the App Store, which by the way doesn't mean shit because it's just based on a logarithmic function of downloads in the last seven days. So if you spam a bunch of people to get a bunch of app downloads, it'll look like you're really popular, even if you're not. Uh, but anyway. So Viddy went for it. They thought they had something amazing. And then the wheels fell off because there was no retention. So the CEO uh, got kicked out. Um, they had to return more than, uh, they had to fire a third of their staff. They had to return most of the money that they ended up raising. And ultimately, um, they were acquired by another web video startup that I'd never even heard of. And I don't think anyone has since heard of full screen, whatever that is. Um, so bottom line. Um, Product market fit is not about how many users you have. It's about retention. So I'm going to talk the rest of the talk about how to drive retention. Any questions? OK. Um, so um, question you should be asking, and this was kind of asked of Avon uh, in the previous session, is if you can grow your business with how your cohort looks today, do you need to worry about retention? Uh, and the answer is um, you always need to worry about retention. So even if you have. You know, you're making, in that previous example, 5x what you're, what you're acquiring users are. You need to worry about improving your retention. Um, improving retention increases lifetime value, and it's going to open up new acquisition channels that are now affordable because you're making more money off of uh, your users. Uh, and that'll allow you to scale faster and build a bigger business. So what happens if you don't improve retention, which is something that Avon did not talk about in that previous example. Um, so you can literally run out of the internet to acquire. Um, can anyone think of a company that's done this? No? All right, let's talk about Twitter. They've done this. Um, so Twitter's MAU activation rate is about 15% right now. So of all the people that come into Twitter and try it out, about 15% 30 days later um, have actually like logged in again. Um, uh, in case you're wondering if that's really good. No, that's not really good. Um, so if you have an extremely low activation rate into you know, whatever your key metric is, like a monthly active user, and you have an extremely effective organic acquisition, um, you'll eventually cap out at the number of people that will become active users. And then you'll leave yourself with a whole host of dormant users. So in the case of Twitter, they've capped out around 300 million monthly active users, and they have over a billion dormant users right now. Um, Re-engaging people who have given you a try and decided it wasn't for them is way harder than getting someone to activate the first time that they try it. So now Twitter's stuck in this problem where they've signed up almost the entire internet population, and they're like, OK, these people tried it. They didn't get it. How do I get them to even give us a second chance? And then what do I do differently to try to convince them to stick around? Very hard. So, Always worry about retention, even if you have a positive balance on like you know CAC versus LTV. You're still always trying to improve that retention. Don't run into Twitter's problem. Ask anyone that's an investor in them right now; they're feeling it. Um, so yeah, what would Twitter have liked to do? They'd have they'd have preferred to have like an unauth experience, not trying to sign those people up. If they can't control how many people are coming in, um, but they can control how many people sign up via like prompting for it or saying, "Hey, we're not ready to." grab users in India right now because we don't have a localized product or whatever the case may be, then just don't try and sign them up. Wait until you have a better retaining product, and then try and push those people towards sign up. 
All right, so let's move on to improving retention. You're bought in that improving retention is an important thing to do as a business. Um, so let's talk about what lunch and dinner uh, for uh, retention mean. So um, the, the first thing you should think about for retention if you're going to work on it are product improvements, onboarding and education, uh, emails, notifications, and customer service. Uh, and then as you get more advanced and you're thinking about how can you do more to drive retention, you start thinking about new products and engagement and loyalty programs. And I'll cover uh, some of the things I've learned working in all these different areas, um, and then we'll, we'll take some questions. All right, so product improvements. Um, so using the product to drive retention usually is from a maniacal focus on improving the core product. So it's not about, at the start, building crazy new things that impress people. It's about what do you have that's already driving value that people are already getting value from and how do you make it more valuable or make it valuable to more people. So um, for Grubhub, what, what do we do uh, to drive more value to improve retention? So we just increase the number of restaurants that were on the platform. Um, every time you increase the number of restaurants that people can order from, there's a higher chance that they'll convert every time they come back to the service. Prove that time and time again so just always had a functioning sales force working on bringing not only just more restaurants, but restaurants of different types of cuisines in different areas um, so that we would retain more people. Um, we, also we also tried to lower the minimum to order. So restaurants prior to you know, online food delivery, um, they were accustomed to just setting a minimum amount that, they would, that it was worth it for them to go deliver the food for. And certain markets had um, designated like kind of where that equilibrium was. So in New York, it was no minimums at all, no fees. But in a place like San Francisco, a lot of the restaurants had like $25 minimums, which would take you like, say you're a single person, you want to order food, you know, you go to the website and you're like, well, I don't want to order 25 bucks worth of food, I just wanted a sandwich. Um, and then those people, you know, wouldn't end up using Grubhub as a habit. So effectively working with those restaurants, showing them how if they lower their minimums, they get more volume that makes up for you know, uh, not having as high a margin on each of those deliveries. Um, the other thing we did is, is we, we used to have a feature at Grubhub where you could order as a guest, meaning you didn't have to create a password or anything. We just kind of let the order go through. And we thought this was great for acquisition and conversion, right? It's just like, hey, as simple as possible, get people to place an online order. Um, but what we started doing is we started looking at those cohorts year over year, um, and we started to see our year over year cohort go below the previous year. Um, so we were all uh, freaking out, panicking. Um, so we segmented the data based on people that had created Facebook accounts, people that had signed up with email, and people that had continued at guest. So the number of people that continued at guest had risen dramatically, up to 50% of first time users. And the retention rate on those users was tanking a lot year over year. So what we did is we entirely redesigned our sign-up flow to emphasize the value of creating an account. And then we hid the guest ordering option at the very bottom of that. And literally the link to continue as guest would be, don't create an account, I hate convenience. That's what it said. Um, and basically what happened is you know, we went from something like 50% of people continuing as guests on first order, something like 15%, and, the, and all the people that were creating accounts now that didn't used to, they were retaining like people before who had created accounts. So it's about saying, hey, this is a place that you're going to create a habit for. Here's all the reasons why it's valuable to continue to use Grubhub. And really selling that I ended up improving our retention a lot. All right, so moving on to Pinterest. What does Pinterest do in the core product to improve retention? Well, it took us a long time to figure that out, actually. Um, so one of the things was actually making sure um, recommendations were localized. So it, it sounds crazy to think about it, but like when I joined Pinterest and a person in France signed up for the product, they got all American shit, all American recommendations, you know, the American definition of what a cake is, et cetera. Um, and you know, it turns out uh, French kind of want French stuff, and uh, British people want British stuff, and German people want German stuff. So when we started tuning our algorithms to make sure that we're using the locally most popular stuff instead of the globally most popular stuff, which was biased by the US, our attention shot up dramatically. Um, we also had to localize key actions. So we had this harebrained idea that like, oh, we're going to brand pin it like we brand tweet or, you know, in other companies. So across the world, you know, that button to save on Pinterest is going to say pin. Um, turns out that means some completely unflattering things in certain countries. I'm not going to talk about what that means because I'm on camera. But if you want to learn about what that means in French, I will happily tell you later. Um, but anyway, 
we switch it to the local word for save, and all of a sudden, our activation rate and our retention rates improve, right? So making sure people in different countries can understand what you're trying to do, not letting yourself get cute with the brand kind of impact uh, your retention. Um, and lastly, um, I think it's, it's fairly well known that Pinterest in the US is a heavily biased female service. And while we don't think anything about the Pinterest product, is inherently female. Um, it was heavily adopted by certain communities that were heavily female. Um, and our onboarding flow um, made that bias worse. So what happened when you signed up and you were a man is um, we would ask you to connect to friends. Your friends would more likely be women than not. So you'd start following everything that your female friends were doing, uh, which meant that you got wedding dresses, you got cupcakes, you got like how to do a smoky eye. Um, you got a bunch of things that you just probably weren't interested in. So it created a, this um, perception that you know, Pinterest is not for me if I'm a man in the US. So what we did is uh, when men signed up, we just started asking them what topics they were interested in instead of connecting them to friends. And then we would connect them to that content on Pinterest. And then they would see like, oh, there actually are manly things on Pinterest. I can learn about my own personal style. I can do woodworking projects. I can travel, whatever the case may be. Um, and that improved uh, how many men got value from the product. All right, so next I'm going to talk about onboarding education. So um, this can either be a big opportunity for retention or not much of an opportunity at all. Um, it just depends on the type of business you're building. So at Grubhub, 85% um, of people who signed up ordered on the first day. So we never really cared about activating people that signed up because all of them were doing it. The only people that weren't signing up and immediately ordering were people that like they signed up in Minnesota or something where we didn't have any restaurants. And that, that just gave us data on where to expand into next. Um, but at Pinterest, it's a huge focus. And you'll frequently hear this like wisdom thrown around startups where, oh, if your product needs education for people to understand it, then it's a bad product or it's a bad design. Um, it sounds cool when people say that, uh, but I think it's fucking bullshit. Like, uh, user education can help a lot especially if there's a lot of things a product can do. Um, and you shouldn't shy away from that thinking that like, oh, it's a bad design principle to educate. So Pinterest, we spent a lot of time on it. And, but the first thing we started on was addressing the cold start problem. So most services, when you sign up, um, you give a bunch of your information, and then you land in a product that is basically empty. And you have to do something, or you have to connect with people um, to get uh, some value out of that. And a lot of people, they don't know what to do, so they bail. Um, so what we did at Pinterest early on, as I mentioned, is we you know, said, here are your friends that are already on the service. Here are a bunch of great people that are doing great things on Pinterest. And you have to follow them to, to continue into the product. Um, and we did that. People would get a great feed, mostly if you were a woman. But um, you would get a great feed um, without having to do any work. Um, so later on, you know, we switched this to, um, to, to which topics you needed to follow, um, which created a, a new problem for us which is we had to make it clear um, how the user can get value from what you're asking them to do. Um, so the more questions you ask, the less likely people are going to finish um, a product unless it's very clear why they're being asked these questions. If it's very clear, it can actually improve the activation rate because they feel like, oh, this product is addressing all the questions I have and it, and it really understands what I'm trying to do. But if, if it's not apparently clear, they will just try to skip as fast as possible to get into the product or they will bail. So when we started asking people, which topics are you interested in, we had to say, like, oh, we're going to customize the, the content that we show you um, to make sure it's good. Um, the, the next thing that we started working on at Pinterest, which I think is really important, is you have to show and endow progress um, as you move people into a product. So people are busy. They're doing plenty of other things. Um, you have to tell them, like, hey, this isn't going to take an hour to get into. So uh, at Pinterest, you know, there's a progress bar when you start signing up to let you know how many steps it is and how far along you are. And as soon as we show that, you kind of see that you're already two steps into the process. So you're like, OK, I'm already into this. It's not much longer, and I can get through this. Um, it's really important to do that. It's kind of a subtle psychological thing, but it makes a lot of difference. Um, another thing that we've been working on a lot at Pinterest is making edge of it education available when needed instead of up front. Um, you see a lot of apps still these days where you sign up and they give you like a novel to read about what's going on um, in the app. Um, and then what people do is they skip that, they get into the product, and then they have no idea what to do. So what we've switched to doing at Pinterest is 
we kind of get you into the product really quickly. As soon as we know what content you want, you're into the product. And then as you scroll through the feed, we start teaching you about the feed. As you click on a pin, we teach you about what a pin is. Um, as you go to your profile, we teach you how to manage it. Um, so when people are ready to understand what this thing is about, then you talk about it instead of giving a whole host of things for them to learn up front before they even know what they're getting into. Um, the, the last piece I want to leave you guys with, which, which benefited Pinterest, is um, using the information you have to your advantage. So, um, you know, for our, for our case, using gender matters a lot, right? Um, but also, we started having a lot of people um, come in from SEO. They would land on a piece of content or a collection of content, and then they would choose to sign up. When we started um, using that information to customize what topics we recommended to them, um, we saw activation rates improve because they saw, okay, I landed on a page about double exposure photography. Now I'm seeing that double exposure photography is one of the things I can follow and learn more about. This aligns with my expectations of why I signed up. Um, I also want to talk a bit about how to measure activation. So uh, as we go back to looking at a cohort, um, the way to measure activation rate is figuring out, well, what's the key thing you're trying to get a user to do? Um, and if they're doing that thing over a certain period of time, does it predict that they're going to continue to do it? So for Pinterest, um, you know, that key thing that we're trying to get people to do is save, because that indicates that we showed them something relevant and they decided to take action on it. So our cohort flattens relatively quickly. So if a person is saving um, you know, by the fourth week, they're going to continue to save week after week after week. Um, for our Grubhub, um, like I said, it was measuring on a monthly cadence. So if we got someone to order a second time within that first 30 days, uh, we could reasonably predict that they were an order at least monthly. Um, but you have to figure out what that's going to be for your business. Um, and you have to think, is there an early indicator for this or not? So if it takes nine months for your cohort to flatten, you know, do you have to run every experiment for nine months? That's not ideal. Um, so you have to figure out, is there an early indicator that's going to correlate with that data? It might not be perfect, um, but will correlate so that you can learn faster and move faster. All right, moving on to email. Um, so uh, email marketing. Uh, every company that I have joined um, when I come in has been like, we don't want to see an email. We hate email. It sucks. We don't want to spam our users. We all get too much email. Um, so what I would recommend you know, to a lot of you as founders or early stage marketers is you have to push through this. Um, your customers are not the same as you, even if you look exactly like them. They get less email from you. Um, and generally, they get more value from email uh, than you. So um, you have to figure out a way, like, especially if you're not the founder, how do I like, show this um, to the people at my company so that I can start to invest more in email marketing? So what I did at Grubhub is, you know, I originally pitched them on this perfectly beautiful personalized email program and you know, just immediately got the co-founder saying, well, we're not going to invest in that. Uh, so I uh, decided to start sending emails manually. So we're in three cities at the time. So for each city, I, um, I surveyed uh, the user base and I said, what do you want to hear about from Grubhub? Uh, and the top two things that they said were they want to hear about new restaurants that Grubhub offered and they wanted to hear about new deals that Grubhub offered. We didn't have a lot of deals at the time, so um, I started collecting um, every restaurant we signed up each week, and then I would look at you know, like which parts of the, the city they delivered to, tried to pick like five restaurants that delivered to different parts of the city, and then I would send that to the entire user base as an email, like once a week. Uh, built that into thousands of orders, and then had the data to go back to our founders and say, see, there's something here with email marketing. Imagine what we could do if all of these restaurants were personalized to each person's delivery address. And then we had the validation to actually build a personalized program. Um, which leads to my second point. Um, you want to, as soon as possible, stop sending email like a fucking marketer um, and start sending email like a personal assistant. Um, so what does that mean? Um, uh, marketers tend to send a blast email to like their entire user base about something they care about that uh, their readers don't care about, their users don't care about. Um, so it's, it's driven on like, you know, what fits the brand or what we're trying to push um, when you want to really figure out what does the user care about and how I can provide value to them each time. So how we think about that at Pinterest is right content, right time, and right amount. And this is different uh, for different people. So uh, when I first started working on, on email at Pinterest, I saw that some people um, were on the extreme end of a histogram getting like thousands of emails a week from Pinterest. And I said, well, this, this is fucked up. Um, so, let me email, let me like talk to those people and just make sure it's not a big idea. Ask them why they haven't unsubscribed already. 
Um, and this would help me um, understand how to build a better program for them. And then just call after call, dumbfounded by people being like, no, don't mess with my emails. I love getting these thousands of emails about people that repin my content and follow me. I love learning about who they are. And I'm just like, who are you? What's wrong with you? Uh, but after, after doing that, like after having 10 calls like that, I was like, OK, clearly there are people that want this amount of volume. Um, and they're, we're clearly opening the emails. So let's cater to that. Um, but let's figure out for everyone else you know, what is the right amount and what type of content that they want. So we built a system where, you know, based on your history of opening emails and clicking emails, we're able to figure out you know, which type of content you're most likely to respond to, when do you want to respond to that content, like what time of day, day of week, um, and then you know, like how often do you want to receive this stuff. For some people, they want to receive thousands of emails a week. Some people, they want to receive one email a month. And you should be able to adjust to that fairly quickly in your data. Um, some other things that we've learned at Pinterest, uh, subject lines really matter. Um, calls to action really matter. Design of emails does not matter. What do most companies spend a lot of time on? Making their email look as pretty as possible. We spent like three months on this project uh, making our emails look pretty. And they, they look fucking sweet, honestly. But uh, it doesn't matter. Um, it hasn't improved uh, their performance at all. Whereas we tested 4,500 subject line changes um, via uh, this copy testing tool we built. And hundreds of thousands of additional users started coming back week after week based on these changes. Some emails, their open rates went up over 40%. Um, it really matters to different users how you're pitching the email, you know, what value they're going to get from it. Um, you don't have to test that many variants like, like Pinterest has, but know that like, it's pretty easy to test like four for one email and see what happens. Like it's, um, you can just send, you know, separate your groups, send four, and then see what the difference is. See if you're getting a meaningful lift. Um, uh, what I want to caveat after saying like we tried 4,500 of something is don't get too aggressive with email in general. Um, email vendors have a lot of power. So uh, you know, if you start sending too much email to an individual um, or too much email in general to people, Gmail can just decide not to deliver any of your email. And, and there aren't a lot of options you have until you're a bigger company or you're using an enterprise solution. I can go call them up and be like, yeah, we're sorry. This company screwed up. They'll fix it. Um, so you want to kind of ramp up over time and respond to user feedback. Make sure those emails are being engaged with. You know, kind of tiptoe your way in, and then you can start to get more aggressive over time uh, once you know that they're valuable. Um, and, and another thing you want to do is you want to really mix up email marketing content. So you don't want to send the same email every day or um, you know, the same email every week. You want to find different types of content that you can show to people. Um, I've seen this time and time again, where if you're able to mix things up, you're going to get um, a more, um, more deeper engagement over a long period of time. Whereas if you send an email, the same email every week, the first few times you send it, you might get a lot of engagement. But it will start to decrease over time. Um, and then you're left with a very low performing program that it's hard to fix. Um, one of the key things that we started doing at, at Pinterest is we started measuring not just open rate, not just click through rate, but how much action is driven in the product. And we made a lot of changes on which emails we sent based on that. So there were a lot of emails that were pretty good about getting people back into the product, but not good about getting them to take action once they got there. Um, and a lot of email services, they make it hard to track it all the way through. It's worth this effort to understand, like not just is my email bringing traffic back, but are those people actually converting into my key actions? Um, and the last thing I want to leave you with is that keeping track of unsubscribes is important, not just to make sure that um, you know, you're not running afoul of AOL or Gmail or whatever. Um, but there's always going to be the case to say, well, if we send more email, we're going to get more traffic. It's pretty much always going to be true. But you're also going to get more unsubscribes. So what does that trade-off look like? Um, what is a, a level of unsubscribe rate that you're comfortable with as a business? Um, what, do you, what do you lose when someone unsubscribes? Um, do they never come back to your product again? Does it not affect their engagement that much? These are things you need to learn to figure out how aggressive you can be. All right, um, so moving on to notifications. So with notifications, um, I like to be a little bit less aggressive than with email. So um, there's a lot more um, sensitivity around which notifications people receive. So I generally start with more transactional messaging and then start to see if I can move into things that are non-transactional. Um, 
the, the reason that you want to baby step into this is that notifications are hard to unsubscribe from. Um, so what people do is they'll just delete the app. That's a, a way bigger deal than unsubscribing from your email, um, so you want to prevent that from happening. Um, similar to, to email subject lines, copy really matters in notifications, so get in the habit of testing it um, as this landing experience. Uh, there are a lot of apps that like still, when I click on the notification, they just drop me into the home page of their app. Terrible experience. Like Get me to where you're trying to get me to go as soon as possible. Um, if you have a key reason for why push matters for your business, you should really tell people about that before you ask for push notification acceptance. So you can trigger your own message saying, hey, we're going to use push to do X, Y, and Z before you trigger the Apple prompt or in two years or whenever uh, Android M gets, gets a lot of market share on, on, on the Android side. Um, now, for someone like Pinterest, this is hard to make work because we use push notifications for a lot of different things. So I can't legitimately tell a user, hey, use Pinterest to keep track of your cooking recipes because we might send an email about you getting followed by, we might send a push notification about you getting followed by someone. So priming doesn't really fit, um, or at least we haven't been able to do a test that really fits. But if you have like that killer use case for why push matters, talk about it before you ask someone to accept push notifications. Um, what has been super successful for Pinterest is badging. So um, a lot of people figure out, oh, like what's my push notification strategy? How do I send push notifications? But they miss that for less sensitive things or for less time sensitive things, you can actually just badge the app and get a lot of that engagement. So um, no one is really doing this on Android um, because the APIs for badging are manufacturer specific. So you have to do it separately for Samsung or you have to do it separately uh, for HTC. Um, but the value is there. Um, we ran a year long holdout on, on badging uh, and we saw like sustained lift in DAUs. Like, uh, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, so that's like if you have your app um, and there'll be like a little one next to it, that's something you can control. You know, probably your email client has it, or Facebook certainly has it. Um, if you have a Pinterest app, it certainly has it. Um, it's just something that, like, when they're looking at their screen and they're seeing your app icon, they know that there's something new there. It's less aggressive than a push. You're not telling someone they have to immediately come back, but you are letting them know that if they are, uh, if they are interested in coming back, there's something new for them to see. Right. Any more questions on that? Okay. Um, so something you probably don't hear talks a lot about is marketing um, that matters for attention to customer service. Um, so studies show that people who have a bad experience that is made up for by the company are more loyal um, than people who never had a bad experience to, be, to begin with. So it's really important that you have good customer service as soon as possible. Um, so at Grubhub, we would just go out of our way to repair any negative experience. Um, and this was like, we learned this basically on talking to our restaurants, because they've obviously learned to do this, that if there's any issue with a meal, comp the meal, it doesn't matter. Um, so we did that as well, um, and it led to a lot more uh, repeat engagement. Um, so you want to train your team to, to spot customer service issues and how to solicit for them as well, because there's going to be a lot of people that have a negative experience that are not going to go complain about it or not going to actively call in. How can you learn about those so that you can address them and not have this kind of people just churn out without you knowing you could have addressed it? Um, so at Grubhub, what we did is we trained every customer service rep on how to use Twitter and Facebook to address issues. So um, you have something like this come in, uh, and instead of being like, oh, shit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to immediately skip to the next tweet, um, people would get notified immediately that this happened. They would respond right back to Casey. Um, try to address the issue. And I had multiple times where there's something, something like this is the start of the conversation, and at the end of the conversation is another tweet that says, Grubhub is awesome. So um, know that like, these people are savable, um, and they might even be more than savable, and they might become your most loyal activist. I actually just like, searched for Grubhub last night and saw this. Like, there were like, probably like 10 fuck Grubhub things. Like, Grubhub's got a great product, but like, it's just going to happen at scale. right? People are going to have bad issues, um, and you need to address it. All right, um, so let's move into like the final stage, talking about more aggressive stuff, so kind of the dinner side of retention. So new products. Um, so I talked earlier, like you don't want to build new products early on. You want to just make the product you have that's giving people value better and better. But that, that can only go so far sometimes, and you eventually you need to branch out to new products. So the first thing to do is go, go multi-platform. And that's not just going from web to mobile, but sometimes the reverse. There's so many apps that waited forever to build actual mobile website, and then they see a ton more engagement once they do better acquisition channels as well. So um, 
every company I've seen has LTV at least double when they get someone to go multi-platform. Um, just every, every company I've ever talked to, every company I've ever worked for, really important to make sure that you go where your customers are. Um, and that's not just being on mobile, sometimes that's being on their desktop as well. Um, you can incentivize this as, as a retention play. So at Grubhub, um, we looked at data, you know, we saw, oh, if we get person on a second platform, their LTV doubles, um, let's try and force this. So we spent like over $400,000 advertising $10 off your first mobile order in like 2009 or whatever. Um, and we were scared shitless, right? We didn't know if these people were going to retain like the people um, that had done it organically, but they did. Um, it, it paid off a lot. We saw you know, all of our cohort, uh, all of our cohort stores start to increase in value. Um, uh, the other thing you can do is you can optimize this um, like we did at Pinterest. So if you uh, land on mobile web, we're going to be increasingly aggressive about getting you to download the app. Um, where you know, a lot of people don't like that, but the, the data shows that people are 3x more valuable in our case when you get them to uh, use the app. So um, we're aggressive about it, and we've got increasingly better about how to get people to do that. And I'll show an example later. Um, one thing that you should understand about when to build uh, new products is just understand core product limits. Um, so Snapchat's a good example of this, right? So they had a one-to-one -one product. Um, and some people were never going to be comfortable um, you know, kind of returning snaps. So they built stories where you can engage with multiple, uh, you can engage with multiple things, and they're available for a longer period of time. So there's more likely chance when you open up Snapchat, there's something to do. And then they built Discover so that you can get stuff from brands that's always going to be around. There's always going to be fresh content. So it's really understanding, like, hey, there's a there's a limit to how engaging our core product can be, and then let's build a new product that can be even more engaging, reach more people. Um, so this is an example of what we do now when you land on mobile web. Um, so we give you kind of a glimpse of the content, and then we're aggressively pushing um, the app, um, even, if you're, even if you're logged in. Um, all of these things have been tested at least 10 to 15 times, uh, and pretty much every time we've tested it, we've been able to get a lift. So really understanding where you have that opportunity to make someone cross-platform uh, cross is important. All right, lastly, let's talk about loyalty and engagement programs. So um, big misconception people have, if they haven't spent time in marketing before, or haven't spent time working on growth, is that these are supposed to be profit drivers, not, not cost drivers. You're supposed to make more money by launching you know, a loyalty program or an engagement program. And, and the way that I think about them um, is you have uh, a user that's either frequent or frequent, and loyal or non-loyal. So if they are non-loyal but frequent, then what you got to do is figure out, like, where are the times that they're doing the activity you want them to be doing and not doing it on your platform and incentivizing them to do it on your platform? And if they're loyal but they're infrequent, you have to figure out um, you know, what are use cases you have that they're not using the product for and how do you incentivize those, get them to try that on, the, on your platform so that they become more frequent. Um, if they're frequent and loyal, that's fantastic. You have an amazing business. So what you want to do is just prevent them from changing. Um, by building a moat around them. So you want to lock them into what they're doing. And, and you're willing to lose money to do that, because you'll kind of guarantee your future returns. Um, if you happen to have a product which is infrequent and non-loyal, um, you generally have to build additional products and services, or you have to accept that like, your retention is going to be pretty low, and you're going to have to reacquire users every time they need the service. So how do you find out which of those buckets to focus on? Um, so apartments.com, which I worked on uh, for a few years, Definitely infrequent, non-loyal bucket. You know, people only look for apartments once a year. Um, if that, um, which means that by the time that they need a new apartment, they probably forgot where they got their last apartment from. So, um, you know, we could do some things that would uh, uh, engage the LTV a little bit more by like engaging them in moving services or teaching them about their new neighborhood. But there wasn't a lot we could do. Uh, to close the gap between the times that they needed new apartments. We tried launching like an apartment living lifestyle blog, but there just wasn't a lot of interest there. So we had to accept that you know, when people need an apartment again, we might have to reacquire them because that brand loyalty isn't going to have been built. Um, at Grubhub, we had, we had to figure out what the biggest opportunity was. We weren't sure. So um, first thing we did is we surveyed our user base to figure out um, you know, what their loyalty was to us, were they using us every time, um, and what the frequency of the category was. So if they weren't using Grubhub all the time, how often were they ordering delivery in general? Um, and then we uh, clashed that with our data to see what did our frequency look like to figure out what the gap was, and was there a lot of opportunity to bring delivery orders that weren't on Grubhub onto Grubhub. Um, 
And then we, we interview these, these same people to understand why. Was it a product issue? Did we not have the restaurant that they like to order from? Um, and to figure out, like, hey, can we, can we move these orders that are not on Grubhub onto Grubhub? And it turned out it wasn't a product issue. It was just generally these people had formed a habit around the pizza place well before they heard about Grubhub. So they, were, they had the number in the phone. That pizza place knew their regular order. Um, so they were comfortable doing that without Grubhub. So we had to figure out, can we actually incentivize people to switch over to those orders to Grubhub? Because Grubhub's a better experience. Um, and that's the hard stuff. So um, the first thing you have to look at is the business economics of trying to switch this engagement. So um, if you're a marketplace like Grubhub and someone spends $30 with you, uh, you don't make $30, right? You make three to five if you're, if you're doing well on your take rate. Um, so by the time someone says, oh, I've spent a lot of money with Grubhub, I'm expecting to get like, some money back, you're just breaking even on your acquisition cost. Um, so you know, we did the math on this in a traditional you know, points program or a punch card program was like 25 orders, get a free drink. Not super compelling. Um, so we had to get a little bit more, um, a little bit more creative. Um, so what you can do here before you build something big, which I'll talk about, um, is you can test incentives through email, right? See which kind of incentives really uh, get people to try to, to switch um, orders over to your platform. Um, and then you have to figure out if you can do a variable reward. So the dirty little secret of loyalty programs is that they all tend to ebb in effectiveness over time because people get used to uh, the reward, and which means they no longer value it, which means that it doesn't affect their behavior, which is what you want. So variable rewards means that you know, the person doesn't know exactly what they're going to get. They're going to get something valuable, but they're not sure exactly what it is. And then it's less likely that they get used to that. So at Grubhub, what we figured out is, um, hey, if you know, 25 orders and a free drink doesn't, doesn't uh, motivate people, can we increase the perceived value of the program without actually changing the unit economics of it? So we settled on creating a game of chance. So instead of after 25 orders, after every three orders, you get to play a game. And, after that, and with that game, you have a one in four chance of winning free food. Same kind of odds, um, but the game was actually fun. It increased the perceived value and increased the chance of people thinking they were going to get something. So um, when you start venturing into games, get a lawyer. Um, so uh, you know, there's lots of weird things here with uh, you know, if you're a sweepstakes, um, you have to do stuff by state. You uh, need to be able to play without purchasing, things like that that you have to support. So um, you know, don't tread into this lightly. Um, so in our case, uh, testing this became very complicated. We couldn't A-B test. Um, so the choices were to test states against each other. Um, and in our case, we didn't have two states that were really alike at the time. Or to pulse, like the Monopoly game, have it available for a limited time, see what the lift is, drop it down, and then bring it back so that you can continually test. Otherwise, your, your head of finance is going to be really frustrated by an increasing amount of spend on a program that they can less and less prove the effectiveness on. All right, that's all I had. So uh, I guess we can open it up for questions. So, oh, and this is what, this is what it, the game we built called Yummy Rummy. Buying one of these was free food. Could have been a free drink or free food for a year. Uh, it was pretty effective. All right, so any questions in the audience before I look at Slido? Let's see, I don't think there's. Okay. Um, any questions? It's less of a question, but an adder onto your your customer service stuff. Yeah. We found that like um, putting a, a place for people to hear their grievances and tell you what's wrong with your product was great instead of our products rather than going external and broadcasting that to the world. So like our app ratings and stuff to improve our products and put a place for people to give us reason to tell us why they have a one star rating. You know, rather than go to the store, give us a one star rating. And then we have to, like, it's harder for us to recover from that. Yeah, so, it makes a ton of sense, right? So app store ratings are an increasingly important part of getting people to try you. Um, people want to feel like they can be heard, right? Um, so how do you make that easier and how do you make when they're heard affect you know, your, your global plans less and less important? Kind of curious about specifically new feature development. How to do that while shoring up risk? I feel like I've taken a couple swings on new features and missed. And so I feel like it makes our team, we're, we're always, it's almost like you get in this analysis paralysis or when is enough information that's like, okay, now in order to build something that's actually significantly helpful, it's going to take a significant amount of time. Yeah. Uh, so the question is um, if 
how do you think about new product development and um, how do you think about the risk? Like in, in his case, he's taken a few stabs at building uh, new features that haven't worked out. Um, so how do you know how much to invest in kind of a minimum viable product to prove out the value um, versus you know, spending the amount of time and being comfortable that this is gonna add value? Um, so there's a lot of nuance to this. Um, generally, the more you can understand about the problem you're trying to solve before you start building, the better, right? So talking to customers, um, having experiments, um, super important. Uh, as a general product development philosophy at Pinterest, we try to take each problem and skin it down to like, what's the absolute minimum I need to prove to do to prove that there's a there there. And usually you can find an experiment that is you know, relatively easy to do. Um, so for retention-based stuff, we generally just start with email. Like if we email someone about this and they respond, um, that's good. And if they don't, maybe there's an issue there. Um, you're not going to prove every answer that way, but you should try to say, like, what's the minimum amount I can do to prove that the investment's worth it? Um, the other thing, you know, like from a product development prioritization standpoint, is just you have a, a bunch of ideas, um, and especially if you're a new team, um, you want to focus on what are the ideas that have the smallest amount of effort and the biggest amount of projected impact. Um, and you might pick a, a, a smaller impact project um, that's more guaranteed to succeed, that's, that's lower effort, than something that's gonna solve a huge strategic problem. New, new products and new product teams, they're never gonna like, knock it out of the park with the hardest uh, problem to work on, you know, uh, generally, so you want, you want that team to like, get comfortable tackling some small wins before they go after the big issue. Uh, in the case of growth or retention, um, what I advise people is like, don't start with activation. Activation's always like, the hardest problem to solve, um, so instead, start with trying some you know, people that are engaged but could be slightly more engaged. Like prove some value there and then go after activation once you've like, got some wins on your belt and you've built some confidence. And those people have gotten more time working together on growth related problems and know that they can actually move these things. Um, I don't know if that, that helps. Very much so. Okay. Cool. Questions? All right. Um, okay. Can you give us an example of non-loyal and frequent and the solution for that problem? Okay, uh, let me go back to uh, what that means. Okay, uh, so, so this was non-loyal and frequent. Um, so this was actually where Grubhub was um, when we started our engagement program, and that people were ordering delivery, um, in some cases, multiple times a week. Uh, but they weren't using Grubhub for all of those scenarios. So the question was, what were those scenarios where they weren't using Grubhub? Um, and how do we change those scenarios so that they want to use Grubhub in, in that scenario? And for us, it, we found that a little bit of incentive, playing a little game, a chance to win free food for a year was enough to do that. Um, I was trying to think uh, of another example. Um, so for Pinterest, right? So um, Pinterest has search, Google has search. Um, sometimes people search directly on Pinterest and sometimes people use image search or they use the web search. So we have to think about how can we migrate um, searches that Pinterest is better for, which is definitely not all searches, but more searches where you want ideas versus when you want answers. That's where Pinterest excels. How do we make sure to build that understanding that Pinterest is the place to go instead of, uh, instead of Google? All right, um, what are the best tools for personal assistant emails? Uh, MailChimp seems to be for more marketing emails. Yes, so um, as you start uh, working on email, um, you're gonna use more of these marketing tools that are easy to build out emails, easy to get stuff out, not so easy to do complex personalization. So uh, that's where we started at uh, Grubhub, but we used vertical response. Um, not even sure if they're still around. Uh, uh, so once you get to the point where you wanna expand your email, Generally, I make the jump to enterprise tools at this point. I think there's, there's probably some more startup marketing tools that are better. Um, I think I've heard Intercom can be successful in some cases for this. But there's really two tools for email that, that work really well. Um, and it's, they change their names every freaking week. Um, but I believe it's called Salesforce Marketing Cloud this week. Um, used to be called Exact Target until they were acquired by Salesforce. Um, and Responsys is the other one. Um, and once you know that email is something to invest in, um, generally you just move to one of these two tools because they're obviously the best and you can do pretty much anything you want to do with them. Um, so 
Uh, I will caveat that. Uh, integrating them is a pain in the ass. You will hate yourself um, for, for having to integrate them. But once you do, they can be very set and forget with a step change in the level of personalization that you can provide. So you know, at Grubhub, we hated ourselves for four months while we implemented this thing. And then you know, every week, we just uploaded via FTP all our new user data, had an incredibly complex flow and exact target. Um, to make sure that people would get like restaurants, this, new restaurants this week, but favorite restaurants the following week and most popular the week after. And it just worked and you didn't have to do anything. Um, and we just saw conversion rates on email rise and rise and rise. Um, so generally I make the leap directly from something like MailChimp into something like Salesforce Marketing Cloud or Responsys. There might be some tools in the intermediate that make sense. I think Sail Through has gotten a little better at that over time. Um, but generally, I recommend just, just moving straight up to the, to the Cadillacs. All right. Um, other than content email, is there any other strategy to retain users for a product that has a once, twice a year use case, like, say, travel? Oh, God. If you're working on a travel business, I feel sorry for you. Uh, wow, hard. Um, so um, the, the best example I have found for this um, are ways to build a community or um, like information that can be relevant uh, for m in a much more frequent basis um, that stitches together um, your product during the transactional needs. So uh, a product I'm going to give a shout out is actually like somewhat competitive um, to Pinterest, but I think highlights it a little bit is House. So House, you're not actually like you know, unless you're super rich, you're not building like additions to your house all the time. You're not buying crazy expensive furniture all the time. But they've been able to give like a browsing experience, an inspirational experience um, around home decor um, so that people will stick around and engage with it all the time just because it's something they're interested in, even if they don't have a dedicated need. Uh, I would tell people to go use Pinterest for that. Um, but, uh, you know, I have to admit that they've done a really good job there being a more transactional business where they're trying to go. Um, stitching together you know, the needs in the interim, um, but very hard. So the mistake a lot of travel companies make when they start out is they start out with you know, some sort of value prop of like, oh, we're going to help you understand where to go better when you go on trips. And then they realize that people take one to two trips a year on average, um, and they start to see also in their early data that because people don't have any trips, they start using the product to see how good it is in their local market. So like, I'm not taking any trips right now, but I hear about this new travel product. Let me search San Francisco and see how good it is. Um, and then they get the bright idea of like, oh, let's switch to uh, being like just a local recommendations play instead of a travel business because that has higher frequency. Um, you're probably going to fail in both cases, um, but uh, it's, it's kind of a, a common sin that I've seen with a lot of travel startups is like they eventually pivot to local recommendations. That's not a super valuable product either. It's a very hard business model. So, Finding a way to, you know, during that big gap in between people need stuff um, to, to show value, create a community, have information, uh, you know, on a regular basis is the best way to do it. But you won't always be successful. Like apartments.com, like we, we created this awesome apartment living blog, but it's just like people aren't really interested in reading about apartment living every day. So it's hard to do. How do I click these out? Uh. Okay, yeah, so any other questions from the audience? Yeah. You've obviously done some amazing things from Grubhub and Pinterest, and we have a company that often gets compared to Pinterest, so we look a lot at Pinterest and what you're doing. Features in the app, but who do you, who do you look to for inspiration? Yeah. Is there uh, a small cool company that you could mention or a person that you follow? Or Oh, so just for, for like retention information in general? Yeah, well, in the area that you Sure. Um, good question. Um, so I think what we found at Pinterest, the more and more that we've iterated on this stuff, the less and less we can look to external people um, to try to figure out what to do um, because we're one of the bigger startups in the space. We have more engineers than most other startups. So um, you know, there's a select few people that I'll ping. You know, like Yvonne is someone that I talk to regularly. He's got a lot of great information on, on various parts of growing a business. Um, there you know, are, are great bloggers, unfortunately very few of them, um, that write really informative stuff. Brian Balfour is a good example of this. Um, and, and then in terms of like who is ahead of Pinterest in terms of their 
you know, uh, how far along they are and how innovative they're, they've been. Uh, you know, generally we look to Facebook a lot in that regard, right? You know, huge growth team comparatively to us. Um, a lot of different issues than we have, but a lot of issues that we expect to face in the future. Like, we don't worry about how to get you know, internet to people in India so that they can use our product, but they're so far along that they worry about those sort of things. So we, we pay a lot of attention to what they're doing. Um, there's a lot of smart people there. A lot of smart people that are now starting their own companies have moved elsewhere that we talk to, uh, you know, from that base of Facebook growth team as well. We're good? All right, I think we're out of time. Thanks, everybody.